Wow. I am glad to be here this morning. Um, I've already had some good times with some of the men and uh, the young servant ladies who were staying after everybody left yesterday, cleaning up after the men, sweeping and mopping and everything. How many of you ladies were helping yesterday afterwards? OK, wow. That was a blessing. Thank you. You know what makes your work valuable for whom you're doing it? And when you're doing it for the Lord, it's very valuable to him. Well, let me just give you, first of all, an introduction of the missionaries for today. Jordan and Jossie Salisbury, uh, they are on their way to the Philippines. And he's actually been to the Philippines for most of his life, about three-fourths of it, and heading home. And uh, they're newlyweds. I know you can tell that by looking in their eyes, you know. <laughs> I love it. It's good. Keep holding hands for about another 50 years, okay? <laughs> All right. And they're going to be presenting their work. Let's see. Well, we're going to have a little, a little introduction time for our afternoon service after we eat. And uh, are, are we still making a wait for dessert till after the introduction service? Can we do that? Can we do that? Okay. See, that will shorten the, the, the second service if we wait till afterwards to have the desserts. We've got some foreign desserts in there. Nothing that will make you sick. It's all good. Filipino and Ukrainian and I think a little Jewish stuff too. And uh, so, that's, you know what? It's all part of it. Experience the culture. I won't take people to another country if they don't promise they're going to eat the food. And, uh, and it stretches us sometimes. So we're glad they're with us. This is their very first meeting on pre-field to meet folks and gather prayer partners. They've got a great prayer card out there, which, which Jossie designed. And uh, they, they asked me about having another prayer card to print it. I said, why? I said, this is great. Just send it to the printer and have it done this way. And they'll tell you all about their work. And uh, about, we'll find out a little bit more about them personally at the afternoon service, and then Vitaly and Ann Sokol. I feel like the old guy this week. I could even be the dad of your pastor and your youth pastor. That's how old I am, okay? I didn't realize that till last night. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pastor Roger, he's like 41. I went, ah, I'm going to be 66 next week. But anyhow, I, from here up, I'm 40s, okay? <laughs> However, from here down is where I'm living every day. Vitaly and Ann are just dear friends from a couple of decades ago. We've known Ann since she was a little girl at our home church in Chattanooga. Came to know Vitaly through Ann, and we're going to hear the story about how they met, how they were following God and met. And uh, awesome people. Vitaly loves to fish. We're hoping to take him fishing this week. Uh, do, you, do you fish, Jordan? Do, do you? Okay, all right, we're doing it. All right. We'll, don't worry. We'll be back for we won't miss supper. The missionary suppers any day. Uh, please be with us for that time and for the church dinner. Well, I know you won't miss church dinner uh, and you're looking forward to me. Hurry up and start preaching so we can get to dinner. But it's going to be a wonderful time. It's a great time for you to get to meet these folks, find out how you can pray for them and for them to get to meet you also and find out how they can pray for you, because that's an important part of missionaries visiting churches to find out how we can connect and return the prayers that we receive so much. I'm going to give you a little hint of what I'm going to be preaching on this morning. We're going to be talking about Revelation's Lamb and the Lord's Supper. And it's interesting that the Lord put this together about six weeks ago. I was praying and, and talking to the two pastors about the conference. And uh, it's crazy because I've always, for, for many years now, I've felt like we're living in Acts and we're looking at Revelation. They, are, they seem to be so close together now. And there's got to be an important, urgent message in there for us, for the church. And that's what we're going to look at this week, starting out with the lamb in Revelation, who is actually the Passover lamb, Jesus. But leading all the way to the, the service after this. Oh, that's right. I got one more service where they eat. OK, I'll try to be short in that one, too, about how we're living in Acts. The Feast of Weeks is being fulfilled right now. We are in the middle of or toward the end of the fulfillment of a prophetic feast of Israel. And we have a very important part to play in the fulfillment of that feast before the Lord comes back. 
And we're going to keep emphasizing him because it's all about him anyhow. Then we're going to have the dinner. We're going to come back in here and have just a question and answer time with the missionaries, get to know them, and then go back and eat the delicious desserts, the American desserts. And by the way, they, they enjoy eating American desserts too. I don't, I've never seen a dessert I would turn down anyhow. So we're going to have a good time today, and then you'll be able to get home and get your Sunday afternoon nap like I probably will. If, I, if Dale and I can stop talking about fishing a little bit. And uh, by the way, you guys that fish, you got to see Vitaly's pictures of the fish he caught in Siberia. The guy he was fishing with was dressed in the hide of a, probably a caribou or a reindeer maybe, but the guy looked like a, he looked like a mountain man. And uh, that's what Vitaly is actually too. But look at his fish pictures. That'll, that'll be a blessing. He'll be excited to show you his fish pictures. And then tomorrow night, uh, tomorrow, let's see, Monday evening, the Sokols will be presenting their ministry uh, in sound and pictures for you to see, along with the things that are out there at their table and their prayer card also. My message will be looking at Revelation now. We're living in Acts now, but we're looking at Revelation because I used to think all of my life, mostly, I thought of Revelation as being a long, long, long time away. Do you know how far Revelation is away? It could be one half of a heartbeat away from beginning. Now, we don't live like that because we don't remember that. We have forgotten that people that we know, people that we're related to, people that we live in the neighborhood with, work with, could be some of those people that are calling out for the rocks to fall upon them. And we can't forget them. The songs, the music was beautiful this morning. But I told, turned and said to Ann, I remember the first time I ever heard that song, uh, Everyone Needs the Lord. Oh, people need the Lord. It was back in the, the 80s when it first came out. Awesome contemporary Christian song came out. And, and here it is 30 years later, still working on our hearts. Tuesday... Uh, then, of course, a missionary supper before that Monday night service. Tuesday evening uh, will be the Salisbury's presenting their work. And then I'll be bringing. And by the way, since they're doing a missionary presentation, I won't be preaching a full length message. Hold your applause, OK, because I know you need to get the kids home for school and everything. You need to get home for work. But I'll be bringing a message living like Revelation soldiers. Now, there's a description of the believers during Revelation. Uh, one day I'm thinking, I'm reading about these people living in the same sins that we're living in. So it takes the same kind of strength and purity that the Revelation, Tribulation saints have to get through that time. It takes the same person now. So we better know what we need to be now. And then on Wednesday evening, it's going to be, be very different. There's going to be three short messages. This is a little bit like in Ukraine. Sometimes you go to Ukraine and there'll be two or three messages during the service. Uh, we're going to bring three short messages. Each of the missionary men is going to bring a short challenge to you about how to implement everything that we've heard this week from the scripture, how to make missions a part of your life, how to make evangelism and reaching your Jerusalem a, a vital part of your life and how you can be involved in their ministry by prayer. And then I'm going to finish up with a very short Jewish message about the living sacrifices that Paul talks about in Romans 12, 1 and 2. There were two sacrifices in the temple that didn't die. And he says to the believers, you're to be living sacrifice. So we're going to go back and look very quickly at those living sacrifices to see what the picture was that he was trying to get us to understand that we're supposed to be as living sacrifices. And I have prayed and I hope you have that these four days will forever change our lives individually and that these four days and what God does and says will change this church. Um, I, I love you people. I'm going to see you in heaven forever. But we are not all that God wants us to be now. And desperately, he needs us to be the people that he wants us to be now. So may we pray that he will do that. And then we'll look in the book of Revelation. Lord Jesus, um, you have brought us to this time. Um, I sort of get scared seeing how amazing your sovereignty is, how perfectly you plan everything. And 
Lord, please help me not to mess it up this morning or any time that I speak. May it be your words coming out from your word, your thoughts, the things that you have already convicted me about and burdened me about. Lord God, may we be about your business in these last days. Um, we could uh, in a moment be with you either by you coming to get us or by some other means. And we realize that and we want to be ready for your coming, ready for our going. And we want others around us to be ready for the moment when they go. Lord, help us today. Listen to your spirit. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. It's interesting that a message on the Passover would start in Revelation. But it wasn't my plan, but I'm following God's plan and this is it. Um, the book of Revelation is very amazing because it tells us of future things. But John was writing in the first century, probably about 90 A.D. And it's amazing what God showed him. <clears throat> and some of this stuff scared the bejeebies out of John. OK, first of all, John was living with survivor guilt. He was the last of the apostles. His brother and all the other brothers had died long before this. He's living with survivor's guilt. And he's seeing stuff that's scaring the fire out of him because he can't understand it. He couldn't see it. Do you realize that Paul, uh, that the apostle John sees into our century? Uh, we're studying through Revelation one time in my Sunday school class. And a guy in my Sunday school class who's retired military he was, a, he was a helicopter mechanic for the Army for like 25 years. He raises his hand and he said, you know, this description that John gives in here, <clears throat> it sounds like an Apache attack helicopter shooting rockets. He said, this is crazy because John in the first century was seeing how the end times are going to be. And he didn't understand all this stuff. So he's just trying to describe it the best way he can. But there's one thing about it that he looked at and did understand. And that was every time he looked at Jesus. Revelation 5, verses 5 to 9. How did you know what my text was going to be? I didn't tell you that. You no, I did not. So I don't have to read my text again. Revelation 5, verses 5 to 9. But turn over there anyhow, because there's a couple of verses that I just noticed this morning back in chapter 4, verses 8 to 11. Verse 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around or within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. This is the original holy, 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 long before it was written. Who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. One of my favorite contemporary Christian uh, groups is called Casting Crowns. And this is where they got their name from. And every time they sing, they want those to be crowns that they can cast before the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what they say. You are worthy. You are worthy are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And then in Revelation 5, the passage that we already read, verse 6, there stood a lamb, he sees, as though it had been slain. I was reading that passage one day, and the, the picture hit me. John looked up and saw the Lamb, Jesus, standing like this. Because that's the way he was standing when he was slain. He saw him, Jesus reminding John of what his sins had done to Jesus. I told the men yesterday, I was praying yesterday morning, it just, it, it hit me that my sins and what they did to Jesus... It's like an IED, an improvised explosive device, a homemade bomb. Many of the most recent <clears throat> Medal of Honor winners received their medal for jumping on top of an IED and saving the lives of their friends, their, their comrades. 
blown to pieces. And I'm, I'm thinking about yesterday morning early, thinking about Jesus being a military commander that he was. Commander of the Lord's host. The guy who went in and killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Amazing, awesome savior. But he's called a lamb. And it's like, how many of you, your kids or grandkids have transformers? You know, it's, it's one thing and then you, it's a truck. And then you do three things. I never can figure out how to do it. My grandkids have to do it. Here, Papa, I show you, okay? And, and it becomes this monster thing. All through Revelation, in the same passage, he's called the lamb. He's called the lion. And the strangest words are said about this lamb. And then they came to make war with the lamb. Why do you have to make war with a lamb? We had one lamb that we had to make war with one time. We had a buck. We raised sheep up in Ohio when I was a kid. And we had some dorsets. And dorsets are a little bit, they're a little bit testy. And dorsets have horns. So you really got to watch them. And we had this one buck that the only thing he would understand was a two by four. I'm not kidding you. He would knock the fire out of you if you weren't looking. And my dad said, you know, we got to quit letting him do that. So he said, I've got, I put a pole over there in the corner. And whenever he hits you, you turn around and whack him right between the eyes, right there on the top of those horns, and let him know who's the boss. But it was so strange. First time I did it, I thought, Geez, I mean, I'm attacking a sheep. Okay? But you know, I didn't feel so bad because he backed up three steps and took off running at me and knocked me back in the corner. The lamb was waging war on this earth. He's called the king of kings, the Lord of lords. You know what was the most awesome thing about the last two weeks since Billy Graham died? Never has this phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ, gone out over the airways of TV and radio as many times. And you know who was saying it? Yes, Billy Graham was. When God called me to preach at the age of 16, I knew what I needed to do. I knew the kind of man I needed to be because I always heard Billy Graham say, the Bible says, the Bible says. And then he'd tell you what the Bible says. And he always referred to Christ as the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he's called Lord God Almighty, who was and is. In chapter 5, they sing the song, you are worthy. You are of esteemed value is the word. You are of the highest value. I told the men yesterday, do you know how much you are worth? An object is worth what you will pay for it. Uh, Dale showed me his golden boy. Now, for those of you that don't hunt, a golden boy is a Henry lever action rifle. The rifle that every man wants to own. He's got one. I did not covet. I came close. <laughs> he let me hold it. I threw it up on my shoulder and I said, oh, this is so sweet. Oh, man. This is of esteemed value. Now, Henry rifles are not cheap, but they're worth it. They're made of steel. They're not made of pot metal and stamp things. I told the men yesterday, your value is what God was willing to trade for you. One Jesus. One Jesus for you. One Jesus for the prostitute. One Jesus for Vladimir Putin. One Jesus for every lost person if they will receive him. But notice what he says in this song, what they say in this song. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. These are believers. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you've made us kings and priests to our God. Verse 12, worthy is the lamb who was slain. These are still believers singing. To receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Now, wait a minute. How can you add to God's power? How can you add to God's riches? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. How can you add strength to God? Honor, glory, blessing. How can you increase God? I have strength. 
I have power in my life. I have the ability to bless. I have riches. These people are talking about what they could give to God, not what he could give to them. And do we really increase the value of God by giving him all of our riches? Well, no, not really, but it brings more glory to him than he had before we gave them. And when we commit our abilities, our talents, our families, our honor, our work to God Almighty, he ends up with more glory than before we gave them. So the opposite is when we hold back those things that are us, those things that have come from him, that we are returned to him, those crowns that he has given us. I heard Mark Hall, the, the, the guy who started casting crowds, he said, one day it hit me that anything that I do for God, I need to get down and give it right back to him. And I will someday. But until then, I'm supposed to be gathering more crowns to give back to him. Don't you love it when someone honors you with a, an amazing gift at your birthday or, or your Christmas or sometime? Um, the, one of the darkest moments of my life was when I was dating a young girl when I was a sophomore. We hadn't been dating very long and I didn't know her all that well. So I gave her a box of chocolates for Christmas. And she gave me the most awesome set of wool gloves and a scarf to match it. <laughs> oh, I felt so bad. I was so, I went, oh, of course I thanked her. And I went home. My mom said, would you have a good time? I said, no. She said, what happened? I said, I gave her a box of chocolates. And look what she gave me. And my mother said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> And she said, what were you thinking? I said, Mom, I've only known her for a couple of months, and I didn't want to give her the wrong impression. No, there was, no, there was a miserable day. What is it going to be like someday? Oh, we got to give Jesus a box of chocolates instead of all the honor, glory, power, riches, strength that we had during this lifetime. Uh, it makes me sick to think about it. Clear words in, Revela in Luke 22. Luke 22. The Last Supper. The Last Supper was a Jewish Passover dinner. Luke 22. It was called a Seder. The word Seder means order. There was a particular order in which they did the things because there was a picture in every element of the Passover and God kept bringing them in these pictures every year. And they never got it. They ate lamb for centuries and didn't understand that it wasn't a lamb, it was a person. They talked about Abraham's uh, offering his son Isaac and God substituting a lamb. And they didn't get it. That God's son was going to switch the substitute when he died and there was no longer going to be a lamb to pay a temporary sacrifice for the sins of the people. He was going to put away sin forever. In, in Luke 22, the last time that he ate a meal with his disciples, he gives very clear words about the Passover and about who he was. Revelation's lamb is the lamb of the Passover. Verse 8, he sent Peter and John and said to them, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? He said to them, behold, when you've entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him to the house wherever he enters. Um, down in verse 12, then he will show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it as he'd said to them and they prepared the Passover. When the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them with the word there is deep. It's the deepest longing desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I become the Passover lamb. In the language that he used, he said it to them, before I suffer as the Passover lamb. Now, there's only one problem with that statement. They would look up and say, well, wait a minute, Jesus, the Passover lambs couldn't suffer. 
No animal in the Old Testament sacrifice could suffer as it was off, being offered or it was an unclean sacrifice. So the Jewish people say, well, then Jesus' sacrifice could not be clean to God because he suffered. No. The point was, none of those animals were worthy to suffer for your sins and mine, except for Jesus. And then he took upon himself all of the suffering. 20,000 lambs died at Passover the year Jesus died. That was the only time that the lambs were wasted. Every other time, it was a temporary covering. It was a sign of obedience when the family brought the lamb in, offered it to the, to the, uh, to the priest after they'd watched the lamb for four days. Tenth day of, of the first month in Nisan to the 14th day, they had to watch the lamb, make sure it was clean. They would give it a name. It would be part of their family. Then they'd have to bring the lamb into the temple and hand the lamb to the, to the priest, put their hands on the lamb, and say, we are causing the death of this lamb. We are responsible for the death of this lamb. You know, I didn't do a profile yesterday on myself. I did a profile on Jesus. But if I did a profile on myself, I would say, you know, I'm a, I'm a father, a grandfather, a husband. I'm a minister of the gospel. I love to hunt, love to fish. And oh, by the way, I'm a murderer, a convicted murderer. About 50 miles from here in Lucasville, maximum security prison, I sat in front of a young, real life murderer who had come to Christ a couple of years before up in Warren, Ohio, when I was visiting him in a prison. He became one of the gentlest, most awesome, peaceful, handsome people. I've, I've never seen such a transformation. He looked like Charles Manson when I first started visiting him. He'd been high on crack cocaine for two weeks, had murdered his girlfriend, a young believer, a young lady who got off of God's path, knew Jesus Christ, and this young man had even come and visited our church a few years before that. But he got in with the wrong people. He was unregenerate. He got high on crack cocaine for two weeks, lost memory of everything, killed his girlfriend. After he came to Jesus Christ, his life was so transformed that the first thing he wanted to do was have God show him if he really had killed her or not so he could own it. He said, Mr. Bennett, if I did it, I deserve to die. I didn't tell him that. I said, yes, Wayne, you do. He said, will you please pray with me that God will show me if I'm guilty or not? I said, yes, I will. And that was hard because I knew that if God showed him, he was going to just crush him. A couple weeks later, I went in to see him. I saw him every week, but a couple weeks later, when he came out to the table and sat down, his smile was gone. Tears started coming down his face. He says, I did it. I did it. I said, Wayne, are you sure? He said, Fred, the other night, just as clear as a bell, <clears throat> I remember the moment. I know where I was. I could see myself pulling the trigger. I killed the only person in the world that I really love. I said, where is she now, Wayne? He knew she was a Christian. I said, where is she now, Wayne? He said, she's in heaven. I said, Wayne, when you die, where will you be? He said, I'll be with her. But you know what? I need to pay for my crime. What an honorable man. Oh, my goodness. He owned his sin. And he said, there is a law and I must suffer consequences of that law. Do you know they wouldn't let him change his plea to guilty? His lawyer wanted to make a, a name for himself. And the, it was all over the newspapers. This was back in the, the early 80s. And, and they wouldn't let him change his plea. They had him declared incompetent, crazy. They sent him to Lima State Hospital. He said to me at Lucasville, he said, this is the last time I'm going to see you. 
because I know what's going to happen. This guy was smart. He knew the chemicals that he'd been taking. He knew which of those chemicals were still in the core of his brain. And he says, I know what they're going to give me to prove that I am crazy and to settle me down. I don't need to be settled down. And he did, and he was the most peaceful person I've probably known on this earth. But he said, they're going to give me chemicals that are going to interact with the solder of my brain, what's in there. And he said, if you hear that I committed suicide, I want you to know that I didn't know what I was doing. Because that stuff is going to make me like a schizo. And he says, I, I, God, forgive me. He said, will I still go to heaven? I said, yes, Wayne. I said, were you kidding? I said, you know what? You know who's going to be responsible for your death? They are. Four months later, my best friend in Ohio called me and he said, Fred, he said, it's Wayne. I said, he killed himself, didn't he? He said, yeah, how'd you know? I said, he told me. He told me the chemicals they were going to give him at Lima State Hospital. He was going to commit suicide. And please know that he didn't know what he was doing. He said, wow, what a testimony. These guys didn't have that kind of testimony yet. They hadn't owned what Jesus was going to do for them. But like I told the men yesterday, Jesus dove on the bomb of your sin. And if you've been saved a year or 50 years, you better not get over that ever. Ever. Because if we do, then people will see nothing in our lives different, nothing distinct, nothing that resembles this lamb as though he were slain. Do you know how we resemble him? We resemble him by pushing a broom. We resemble him by blessing others with these foods that we bring. By uh, one day I was praying for some Muslims in our area and I said, God, I, I don't know how to reach them. I know all these books and stuff. I, I, how do I reach these people? I was at the mall. And by the way, that's a stretch for me. OK, it's a real sacrifice for me to go to the mall because there's no sporting goods stores there. You know, no guns, no camo, nothing. I'm at the mall and I see these two two women with the heads and headdresses and they weren't covered here. But they had like six kids running around them in the play area. And I, I looked down and the one little boy's shoestring was loose and it was just flopping. And just like that, I thought of Jesus washing their feet. And I see this little boy and I said, you want me to tie his shoestring? You know, that could be dangerous. I got to get close to these women and, you know. They kill people, some of them do. So, yeah, that was it. So I waited till he stopped right beside of his mother. And I walked over. I did not make eye contact with the women because that could be dangerous for them. Right. Yeah. If their husband found out they made eye contact with another man, uh, they could whoop the fire out of me and kill their wives. So I kneeled down and tied his shoe like I did my grandkids in a double knot so it wouldn't come loose again. And without looking up, I, I got up and stepped back. And when I looked up, one of the mother, the mother of this little boy was looking at me. And she, she smiled. She had this confused look on her face and she smiled and she went like this. And I didn't, I didn't nod my head back in return. I smiled and, and I turned and walked away. Uh, that's what Jesus was going to do to these guys right before the last time. He did it during this dinner, by the way. It was part of the process. But look what he says. I say unto you, I will no longer eat of this until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He gives clear words about what he's going to do. I'm going to suffer as the Passover lamb. And you caused it. I caused it. I'm going to suffer for you. You know, from the beginning of his life, what did the angels say? For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And Jesus says in this passage, this is my body, which is given for you. The word given there is the word delivered up, offered up. 
Like the, when the, the high priest received the sheaf of grain on first fruits morning, the morning that Jesus rose from the dead. How did he offer it? By lifting it up. And he says, I'm going to be delivered up to death for you. He, he says it twice here. This is my body which is given for you. In the verse 20, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. I don't have to do this for me. My blood will be poured out for you. Now, wh what are you doing about this? In relation to the Savior who did all this for you. What, what's coming out of my mouth? Uh, <clears throat> I, I heard the brother pray this morning. I don't even know who it was praying. But it's been a long time since I've heard a man get choked up praying. And I don't say this to honor him, but I, I thought, Lord, when was the last time I got choked up praying, talking to you, talking to others about you? Where, where is our passion for Christ? Where is, the movie's called The Passion of Christ. And after you see that, we just walk away. Oh, that was a nice movie. Where is our passion for this one who is the lamb who was slain? And you and I are the reason that he was slain. I don't even... I'm glad that God has never shown me in total all of my sins, all of my thoughts, brought back the collection of all of my words and my deeds. But all of those things were put on somebody who never did any of those things. And all of your things were put on him too, at one time. In one moment in history, we did that to somebody. Do you know how, I, man, I feel bad if I, if, if I hurt somebody, uh, if I accidentally hurt somebody. If I'm defending myself, it's different. But I still feel bad. Okay? I, man, oh man, how can you not feel bad if you hurt somebody? We didn't just hurt him. We killed him. But Jesus said, this is my body. This, this bread, it's pierced. It's striped by his stripes. We are healed. It's crushed before they eat it. You and I did that. Isaiah said, yet it pleased the Lord to crush him, to pulverize him. God did it, but you did it. I did it. Peter says, you, Romans, Jews, and all Gentiles, with animal hands, have crucified the Son of God. And how many times do we come to the Lord's table and it's just a piece of bread, it's, it's a little juice, and then we're out of there. And we're not any different. It's not just a piece of bread. He said, this is my body which was delivered up for you. Do this to wait expectantly for me. The word remember there means to rehearse in your mind what happened and look forward to what's going to happen. Same word that, that Paul uses in Corinthians. This cup is my blood of the new covenant, which was shed for you. Do this waiting for me. Not forgetting that you crushed him. Not forgetting that you pierced him. And so did I. Not forgetting that by his stripes we have been healed. But also not forgetting that we're waiting for him. And we're not waiting very well right now. We got a box of chocolates in our hand. Instead of honor and glory and blessing and riches and power and strength. That someday in the future they will sing that. You know why? Because they've given, most of them have given their lives for him. Now, right now, he's usually not asking people to die for him. He just wants them to live for him, but to be willing to die. As we take the Lord's table today, I don't know. Um, it's between you and him. But if you're just holding a box of chocolates, I wouldn't take something that symbolized his precious body that was ripped up, torn up, 
pierced because of me? The Jewish people, at a certain point in the dinner, they take the matzah tosh, which has three pieces of bread in it. <clears throat> they don't know why. They don't know why they pierce holes in it. They don't know why they put stripes in it. They don't know why they've got three pieces. But the middle piece has a name. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't name my food. Okay? I call my truck silver. Okay? It's a silver Nissan Frontier truck. This is actually silver, too. I wore the first silver out. Um, but they call this piece of bread the place of judgment. I said, what? Are you kidding me? Afik omen. I said, is that, is that Hebrew? No, it's Greek. It's a Greek word. It's not even in the New Testament. Oh, where'd you get it? I don't know. Rabbi made it up. We call it Afik omen. I said, why do you pierce it? Well, we don't know our custom. Uh, why are the stripes burned into it? I don't know. It's our custom. What's the name mean? Place of judgment. Or that which comes afterwards and returns. So my one buddy, former well, Jewish friend, seriously said to me, so it's like dessert. I said, must ain't dessert. What are you talking about? He says, well, because we have to eat it eight days in a row, sometimes we dip it in chocolate like you do pretzels at Christmas time. I said, you kidding. That's cheating, man. You're supposed to eat the plain old unsalted what we're going to have this morning. Um, because Isaiah said, when we shall see him, there's nothing about him that we should desire him. No woman ever comes up. After the dinner today, some of you women will go, I, I need the recipe. Uh, Maggie, can you give me the recipe for that food? It was so good. My husband likes it and I'm going to make it at home. Nobody asked for the recipe of matzah. <laughs> it's nothing. What does it taste like? Whatever you put on it. <clears throat> Peanut butter, whatever. That was Jesus. He wasn't some handsome dude riding on a horse. And all the Jews said, we got to believe in him. He's our Messiah. No. And they, they, break, they break the Afik Omen. Only this piece. They break it in a certain ceremony. And they take part of it and give it to each person at the table. Everybody has to eat a piece of the broken place of judgment. And then they take the other piece and put it back in the matzah tosh, which has three compartments in one. Who made that up? They did! I'm, this is crazy. It's like Baptist. <coughs> Don't accuse a Jewish of being like a Baptist, okay? Jewish people. But they do this. They crush it. The father crushes what they call the buried Afik omen. And he goes and hides it. It has to be hidden where a child can find it. Whoop, that's what Jesus said. They don't realize they're, they're going back and replaying Jesus in the Passover. When Jesus said, unless you have the faith of a child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> this has got to be at a place where a child can find it. When he brings it back to the father, they say, oh, he's redeeming the Afik omen. He receives a reward from the father. Then everybody at the table has to eat what is now called the resurrected Afik Omen. You see, we crushed him. <coughs> yes, it was the Father. Yes, he did lay down his own life. But we are the reason that he had to die. May we not ever forget that, but especially this morning as we come to the Lord's table. May we pray, please.